ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues from different institutions of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Good mm -hmm. afternoon. I'm Kolani Nameka. I'm going to be your program director for our Speak to a Scientist webinar this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, <coughs> today's Speak from... to a Scientist program is based on unpacking the structural biological concepts, principle, and economic benefits that improve the quality of life for Africa and the world for one healthier world. Without wasting any time, let me go straight to our program outline. We are joined by our Senior Science Center Manager, Mr. Akash Dasrath. We are also joined by our guest speaker, who will be introduced by Mr. Akash Dasrath. I will also be facilitating question and answer session, and then I'll be closing this session with vote of thanks. Without wasting any of our time, please let's give reins to our Senior Science Center Manager, Mr. Akash Dasrath. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Kulani. Um, and good afternoon to everyone joining us today for our Speak to a Scientist talk entitled Unpacking the Structural Biology Concepts, Principles and Economic Benefits to a One Healthier World. Good afternoon world. to everyone joining us today for our Speak to a Scientist talk entitled Unpacking the structure. It's quite a mouthful. So I'm quite interested and in looking forward to the talk. Today we are joined by Mr. Daniel Indima from Cape Bio, who will be delivering the talk. Now, just um, a bit on a background on Daniel. Well, Daniel is a scientist who specializes in structural biology of infectious diseases. He is trained in protein engineering and crystallography bioprocess engineering and biomanufacturing. He holds a, a honors degree in biotechnology and a master's degree in structural biology of infectious diseases from the University of Victoria. Throughout his academic journey, he was awarded multiple awards and scholarships for his excellence in academics, social responsibility, student leadership, and entrepreneurial initiatives. He is a fellow at Ellen Gray Orbis Foundation. Daniel is the founder and CEO of Cape Biotechnologies, a South African biotech company that manufactures molecular biology, reagents, enzymes, and kits for diagnostics, forensics, DNA analysis, and other life science applications. Cape Bio recently developed a SAPRA approved PCR testing kit for the coronavirus detection and is expanding its diagnostics research, development, and manufacturing for diseases prone to Africa and the world. Now, that's quite remarkable. He founded three startups as an undergraduate student and was subsequently awarded the Vice Chancellor's Award. In 2020, he was listed as one of the African influences for change by UNDP Africa. He also featured on Africa Innovates magazine. He is a Mail and Guardian Top 200 South African 2021 winner under the science and technology category. Daniel strongly advocates for science that creates jobs, improves quality of ordinary lives, and contributes to national development and the economy. That's quite an impressive array of accomplishments. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Mr. Daniel and Dima. Uh, program director, I don't know if I'm audible from your side. Uh, nonetheless, I will proceed by sharing my, uh, my screen. Okay, I hope my screen is on. Please confirm product, program director. Yes, Daniel, we can see your screen. Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity uh, that I'm offered by Saibono, which is um, an entity that I believe 
is playing a meaningful role in ensuring that we not only teach um, aspiring scientists and a society at large, but we also demonstrate the capabilities that are developed uh, by our country and the world at large. So I'll be unpacking a very, uh, uh, you know, a topic that is very close to me as a scientist. And uh, just to elaborate, program director, that I am still a scholar, I am still a student uh, in the middle of a PhD project. And uh, I'm the CEO and, and of the company at the same time uh, while I'm pursuing this uh, objective. Just to introduce uh, the company that I'm a CEO for, KBio, a South African biotech firm. We uh, have, have uh, proprietary processes or proprietary uh, technologies that we make in-house. Uh, we manufacture using these uh, platforms, reagents, enzymes, proteins, and diagnostic assays. Uh, these are critical tools that are required uh, during epidemics and pandemics and in general for diagnosis of diseases. We also quite involved in the fourth industrial revolution tools and we have built the world's first proprietary AI platform for biodiscovery of novel enzymes and therapeutic from South African biodiversity hotspots. We have over 20 expert scientists in different fields of science. Our current facility where we manufacture our products uh, it's GMP certified, we follow regulation, and we are a SAPRA approved company. Our value chains are run by prospecting, meaning sourcing of genetic information from nature uh, for, for, for different molecules, development, manufacturing, and distribution of those products. This is the current team uh, that leads the organization across different departments. As you can see, pretty much highly qualified people in the team that are leading this young company. Let me enter into the topic. So what is structural biology? Uh, structural biology uh, actually merges different disciplines such as molecular biology, biochemistry, and biophysics. And it normally, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Prof. Director, I see a, a, a hand uh, from, from your side. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Babandi, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So what we do is to uh, uh, sort of unpack the what we call micromolecules. And uh, I'm going to explain further what are those micromolecules. For example, proteins. Uh, we have seen, uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of these structures appearing on TV when we talk about coronavirus. For, for that picture to emerge, it is made possible by structural biology, meaning we study the structure, the appearance of such a molecule. We can talk about RNA and DNA or membranes in general, which are the molecules that we assess or study at close range at atomic level. So this is the finest uh, last level of scientific uh, uh, sort of study of how these structures acquires such structures and how changes in such structures affect their function. Meaning, if you have a protein in your body and it changes the structure, it may affect the function and it may cause a disease. And we all know that these molecules actually carry out the most functions in our cells. You know, by mere fact that I'm able to speak right now is as a result of proteins and some catalytic enzymes in my mouth that allow me to be able to have a speech. So what we do is to assess these micromolecules, whether from viruses, bacteria, or a normal enzyme that you find in your body where you digest food, and it allows you to be able to do that. Whether in the stomach, for you to be able to digest it, uh, uh, you know, so these are the sort of the micromolecules, but I'm going to explain in detail how we differentiate between different molecules that we assess in structural biology. So in a nutshell, what you see, uh, I'm going to point with, with, with my mouse here, is a sequence of a molecule. A sequence is a DNA sequence or a, a protein sequence. In this case, this is a sequence of a protein after sequencing it. This is how it looks like. 
but you don't know the structure. So what structural biology does, it gives you a 3D print of such a protein. You can see it uh, you know, uh, at close range, at atomic level, you see how it is structured, but you can also see it in complexes. In this case, we're seeing it in complex with DNA. So proteins do bind to DNA, do interact with DNA. And, and this protein that I'm showing here is an enzyme called polymerase, which is used in amplifying or making many copies of DNA. So we can still see the DNA with the protein using structural biology. But you can also see cell structures, you know, our chromosome, which is, uh, you know, the, our makeup as a, as a human being, you know, around DNA. But we can also see the organelle, which is a cell that you can never see with the naked eye, but we're able to bring it forward. And that shows that this is a cell of a human being. Let me give you the history of structural biology because it's not a study that started uh, now. It's, it's, it's a study that is still continuing. In 1912, Max van Loo directed uh, X-rays at crystallized copper sulfate generating a diffraction pattern. That was the first time we see a macromolecule, but from copper sulfate. These experiments led to the development of X-ray crystallography, which is the field that I am from. And it's used in exploring biological structures. In 1951, Rosalind Franklin, which is a, one of the famous scientists together with Maurice Wilkins, used X-ray diffraction patterns to capture the first image of DNA. The things that we normally talk about and say, this is a DNA, these are the founders of this molecule. Francis Crick and James Watson, another famous scientist, modeled the double helical structure, which is a of DNA, using the same technique in 1953, and received a Nobel Prize in medicine along with Wilkins in 1962. Uh, pepsin crystals were first proteins to be crystallized for use in X-ray diffraction by Theodore Swedbeck, who received the 1962 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The first tertiary protein structure, that of myoglobin, which is what we find in blood cells, was published in 1958 by John Kendry. During this time, modeling of protein structure was done using balsa wood or wire models. You can understand where we come from as human beings, how we used to understand certain principles in science as compared to how we then revolutionize science to ensure that we are able to see some of these critical molecules at low range. Fast forward in, in late 1930s and early 1940s, a combination of work done by Isadora Rabi, Felix Bloch, and Edward Mills Hussel led to the development of nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. Currently, solid NMR is widely used in the field of structure biology to determine the structure and dynamic nature of proteins. In 1990, Richard Henderson produced the first three-dimensional high-resolution image of bacteriopsin using cryogenic uh, electron microscopy. More recently now, computational methods have been developed to model and study biological structures. For example, molecular dynamics is commonly used to analyze the dynamic movements of biological molecules. As I mentioned, when we move, when we talk, when we blink, when we cry, when we laugh, molecules are essential part of that process. They enable us to be able to do these molecules. For us to see how those molecules actually behave, we have to look at the structure because the structure enables us to see the function of these molecules. In 1975, the first simulation of a biological folding process using MD, which is molecular dynamics, was published in Nature. Recently, protein structure prediction was significantly improved by the new machine learning method called AlphaFold. This is new development, a novel development in this field. Some claim that computational approaches are starting to lead the field of structural biology. And I agree, because as we modernize our technology and our ability to study these molecules, we are now using the fourth industrial revolution tools. Let me tap into the most important part of this uh, field. Structural biologists, you know, have made you know serious contribution in understanding molecular components and the mechanisms underlying human diseases. 
And I'm going to show you that structure biology is at the center of drug development at the later stage. For example, CRIM and MRR, which I've mentioned, have been used to study aggregation of my myelic fibrils, uh, which associated with Alzheimer, Parkinson, and type 2 diabetes, meaning structural biology is at the center of understanding these diseases and developing drugs. Again, structural biology can be used to explain interactions between pathogens and host cells. And that is a specific field that I'm coming from, where I study the interaction between pathogens and our human cells. We also use structural biology as an important component of drug discovery. Once you understand how pathogens interact with human cells, you are able to use the same tools basically to design drugs that target such infection. Specifically, ligand NMR, mass spectrometry, and X-ray are commonly used uh, techniques in drug discovery process. You know, we have used this as scientists to better understand many molecules, including cancer-related, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, processes, including designing drugs for that. Similar research is being conducted as we speak. Uh, to, to solve the issue of HIV and AIDS, meaning we are busy trying to solve this problem using structural biology. So in essence, we assess the human genomic data to find the tracks that are suitable to humans. We do target protein, which is analysis that uh, include uh, you know, structural biology techniques we screen for chemical libraries, which is different drugs from that. Then we are able to develop a drug based on the human genetic data. The purpose of structural biology is to ensure that we are able to cure diseases. We look at molecules from your head all the way to the toe, how they behave, if there are changes, if there are mutations, if there's any deficiency that help the drug developers to develop drugs to treat any deficiency in your genome or in your DNA. Let me explain the different techniques that we develop over time and how they differ. You can see on your left, small molecules, you know, with about one hand, you know, in terms of size, all the way to eukaryotic cell, which is a human cell or animal cell. You use different techniques at the bottom uh, based on the size of the molecule, as you can see uh, highlighted here. So where we are as uh, uh, you know, X-ray protein crystallographer, we can assess anything between one, one atmosphere all the way to ten nanometer. While other techniques can only look at molecules that are a bit larger. We know of a microscope that is widely used, which is a famous tool that you see every time in Google Science. It's actually used to look at larger molecules. The techniques that we use actually are used to uh, assess it's very small, tiny molecules that you can never see with other techniques. So this is the this is the least that we can do now as structural biology. However, there are development around this field where we can go even lower. Uh, so what is the process of, of of the field that I'm in? Basically, what we do is to obtain protein, purify it, crystallize it. These are crystals of the protein. We do what we call X-ray diffraction. Uh, at the moment, Africa does not have such a technique. Uh, we use what we call synchrotron in, in, in France and other parts of the world where we actually diffract these crystals. And then we are able to use computer models to predict the structure of the, of the crystallography. The process of molecular starts from uh, being able to clone your target genes in cells being able to produce them in E. coli cells, purifying them, and getting a molecule that is pure. What do we do from there? We then crystallize, as I've mentioned, what you see here in the corner is actually a protein that can be crystallized using the techniques. We then diffract and make these small fragments. From these fragments, we do what we call molecular docking, where we do electron, ele electron density map to be able to see the structure of such a molecule. What you see here is a protein from the crystal, from the liquid that I've mentioned. And these are the different structures of different proteins. Why are we doing this? If you can see here the bottom left, uh, the blue part is actually a, a protein that is coming from a bacteria or a virus that is interacting with the human cell receptor. 
for us to understand what's happening, we have to crystallize these two complex, this complex, and understand how they interact so that we can be able to produce a, therape a therapeutic peptide that basically disentangle these two molecules together, meaning we are able to repel infections as a result of the discipline. Let me take you through an example of existing viruses, coronavirus, how it infects human cells. You can see this is a virus, this is a human cell, this is a receptor. My field basically looks at this interaction here. We crystallize this interaction to understand how this pathogen actually invades human cells. As a result, we are able to introduce a peptide, as I mentioned earlier on, that is able to break such an infection. As you can see, the coronavirus, what it does, it enters the human cells, it releases its genomic uh, material into the cell, it then replicates and forms a new virus that then goes to another cell. HIV does the same. Uh, as you can see here, again, the interaction between HIV and human receptors, we study the structure of these two proteins, the spike protein and human, uh, uh, I mean, the, the spike protein of the HIV and uh, 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 the human receptor cells. So, uh, which are CD4 cells. So, what HIV does basically, the reason why it's difficult to, to deal with is because what it does, it releases its own genomic uh, uh, you know, DNA, which integrates with human DNA. Basically, it makes, it makes a virus that has a human DNA. While SARS CoV 2 is easy to deal with, it's because it's RNA related, it just does transcriptions and effect from cell to cell. So our study is to study the structure of this interaction and the exit point and try to break such interaction. Uh, I think uh, I'm done in terms of my presentation. These are our stakeholders and partners of the company that I work for. And I thank you, program director. Thank you very much. Over to you, program director. Side full, short, concise, and straight to the point. Uh, just before I open the floor to question and answer to our participants in this webinar, I see you have also touched on the issue of the genes. <clears throat> and earlier on, there used to be a program I used to watch. I just want to take a little back. Uh, they used to call it Tobias Bodies. Now, when I normally watch this thing, Professor Tobias, they, I think he's the late now from the Vets. He will say it's for us to master the genes that causes us to misbehave, that causes us to smoke, to be alcoholic and dominate those genes. Now, you have mentioned the issue of HIV today, the issue of coronavirus and that it takes structures. Are there any possibilities that certain genes are an inheritance and there's no any particular structure that can deal with that? Can one conclude in such? Uh, program director, uh, you, were, you were cutting a bit in on. Uh, uh, I don't know if you can repeat that please. I'm saying certain genes are an inherit an inheritance. So are there any structures or any systems in place looking at we are using different instruments, some X-ray diffractions and so on, that can deal with such a, 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 a genes that might one might be having them because of an inheritance. So we need to do away with such. Is there such an instrument that deals with it? Uh, th 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 thank you, uh, Program Director. I get your question. It, indeed, uh, we are the species that come from other species. So meaning we've been transferring our genomic data through our generations. And most of these genes are constant through our generations, while some change based on our social behavior based on environmental factors and many other factors. However, for us to uh, get rid of certain genes that are, are a bit problematic, there's a new field which, which is called uh, uh, CRISPR or, or, or CRISPR-Cas uh, technology that is now being used as a genome editing tool, meaning you are now able 
to cut out genes that are a bit problematic in your body. There's, there are ethical issues around that, right? However, this, this, this uh, technology is going to revolutionize uh, medicine throughout the globe because you can imagine if you have a cancerous gene in your, in your body, that gene can be taken out using the same tool. And by the way, that's a field that I extended to in my PhD project. And we are now developing those tools locally, meaning South Africa will also have tools for genome editing. So it's uh, check, check it out, you call CRISPR-Cas uh, in short, but there are many Cas molecules that are used in that regard. Mm. Right, uh, th th thanks. Uh, th thanks, uh, 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 Babandima. You have told me that yeah, it's, it is possible from, from your answer to do away with those genes. Uh, as, as participants are also preparing their questions and so on, uh, I think one of the, my, my colleagues can also assist with, with, with taking questions. I think there's another question in the chat that says, does the virus use its spikes to attach to a human cell? I, I don't know if you got that question, Babandim. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, most pathogens uh, uh, use what we call surface proteins or the proteins that are outside the, the, the cellular layer to attach themselves to human cells. That's the only way they will actually protrude or, or internalize themselves inside the human cells. So some viruses uses, use actually their own polytails just to uh, bypass the immune system for them to be able to be treated like something that the cell actually requires. So viruses or pathogens are actually clever. They know what they are doing and they use this some of the host mechanisms to be able to infect human cells. Mm. All right, right. Let's look at another question from, still from our participants. Are you doing any work on the monkeypox virus? <laughs> I, I think this is the latest one. <laughs> In your research, I think this will, this will take you to, to the PhD. <laughs> so let's see, let's see about the, the monkey, the monkeypox. <laughs> Yeah, we, we actually are busy with uh, our European partners to uh, register an IVD uh, uh, in vitro diagnostic kit in, in the in European market, uh, um, uh, you know, for monkeypox. So we are uh, also busy assessing the same technology uh, at the local uh, at our local facilities. Hmm. Can I use in future as soon as you are done with the research working with the Europeans? and then invite you again to come and give me the results of the monkey pox and talk about the structures and so on. You know, I think that that will be now the burning issue. That will be our next talk when it comes to that. Because I can see it has now gained the momentum, this issue of monkey pox. So we don't want the society whereby again, we find ourselves being in our homes and so on, just like what Corona uh, did to us. So even for the monkey pox, I think we need to speed up when it comes to how can we deal with it and moving forward and other viruses and diseases one might not know about? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Uh, any other question from our participants? Uh, because I promised the uh, Ubabundi that no, I'll try to keep this webinar to one hour. I know CEOs have many ties even to have you on trying, trialing this uh, webinar, wherever you are sitting in Pretoria, I, I know that uh, you are having lots and lots of meetings, but thank you very much that you managed to be with us. Any other questions from the floor colleagues? It's just... Uh, In, in terms of, while, while I'm waiting for one question, I have a question, Babandim. In terms of exhibits as science centers, you know, because we need to start this from the level of learners. And I've seen the presentation, it's, if I can say it, yes, it does talk about structures and so on. But the structures that I've seen, even the methods employed and so on, 
I'm sure you'll agree with me that we are now taking tertiary level up. Now, how do we engage learners from school level, you know, in terms of exhibits and so on, now that we are sensitive and methods that can be employed when it comes to 4IR to say we can work with an organization like your organization to make that possible, you know, for learners to see these things with a different eye. That's my question to you. Mm. I, I think I think it's possible. Um, we we recently um, launched our exhibit at uh, Kofinvara uh, in the Eastern Cape Science Centre, uh, working with the University of Venda, uh, uh, where we exhibit you know these molecules, how they look like, their function, their purpose, uh, in in as far as economic benefits, uh, you know. It's concerned. So we are able to demonstrate that, but it's still digital because uh, you can think about, you know, if you want to demonstrate how, how to crystallize a protein and how to rationalize the entire structure, be able to present to a great learner, uh, you're going to need a competency that I believe is going to be very expensive. However, we are able to demonstrate it uh, digitally to show them how everything works and, and, and the fields or, or spin out fields out of the same field where uh, learners can 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 look up to, including around the, the future of jobs or the future jobs, you know, mm -hmm. leveraging on the fourth industrial tools, merging with the field because the field is already uh, doing that. And I mean, you can think about drug discovery; uh, it's no longer done manually; it's computer, uh, it's computational now. So we need to be able to demonstrate that from uh, uh, early grassroots. And by the way. Our counterparts in Europe, uh, you know, North America, even, even in Asia, they are already showing, you know, uh, you know very complex, uh, uh, you know, systems and processes to very young people so that they grow up knowing exactly how these molecules look like. It's not only proteins, it's also about the structure of viruses, proteins, and our own organs. So I think it is highly possible as long as we have uh, a good budget. However, I wouldn't um, suggest that we go as far as spending billions just to build a singleton for demonstration. But I think we can build a singleton uh, for 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 drug discovery for the entire Africa, in essence. Wow, <clears throat> great! Uh, I think the next question to you is: How does monkeypox differ from the coronavirus? <laughs> Yeah, it, it is. It is not relatively a new virus. It's um, you know viruses. Majority of them come from animals, and uh, whenever they mutate, they tend to cross over to humans. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, you can think about Ebola. You know, uh, amongst many viruses that exist in nature. So this one uh, uh, diva from coronavirus in a sense, in, in terms of its genomic uh, uh, information. Uh, while coronavirus is RNA related, uh, uh, monkeypox is quite a, a, a different kind of sense of the genetic material than that one. And its infection cycle is not the same as the HIV. It does not integrate with human genome, making it difficult uh, to cure or to treat. Mm. Wow, great. Uh, I think another one is that, can I study microbiology to pursue a career in cell biology? Can I study microbiology to pursue a career in cell biology? Yeah, I mean, the, the field of life science is quite complex. Uh, you know, you can start with microbiology and end up uh, specializing in genetics because the field, they do cover each other in terms of modules as an undergrad. So you can study microbiology, you know, where you specifically specialize in, in, in the cells, because uh, uh, the microorganisms that you study are basically cells. So it's very easy to tap into cell biology from microbiology if you just want to focus on microorganisms or those uh, 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 molecules that are within the cells themselves. Mm. All right. So it's possible for one to, to engage into microbiology. And at least for, for, for my side, a little bit of biochemistry 
when you are talking structures that you have displayed there, it, it, it really, uh, I, I got emphasized to say, uh, no, at least I'm knowledgeable with the aldehydes and so on. So structures, they really play a, a vital role. When you spoke about when we laugh, you know, there is a structure there because molecules are also involved, you know. So, so you are you are quite right on that one. So uh, moving forward, another question says, will there ever be a cure for all viruses, even though they mutate? Yeah, that, that's a million dollar question uh, because, uh, you know, research is still underway um, to, to, to cure or to treat various viruses, whether you speak about the flu influenza, you can talk about the HIV uh, or any, any of microorganisms such as TB because they keep on mutating and they evade the treatment. So it's ongoing. So science is very critical because it's an ongoing process as we morph, as we as we multiply, as we evolve as, as human species, definitely we're going to encounter a lot of viruses. Uh, but we just have to make sure that we build very competent platforms in terms of research, uh, diagnostics, uh, vaccines, and therapeutics, so that as and when we encounter those, uh, we are actually able to deal with them precisely. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the, the Western world is more well advanced. It's not just advanced in terms of any other things, but it's because of their scientific uh, outputs that they've demonstrated over years. It's not something that they built overnight. That's why when there's a problem, they are able to come in very quickly. So what we need to do in Africa is to build those competencies, sustain them and ensure that they last for future generations so that one day when we face something that is worse than coronavirus, we are able to stand on our feet and deal with it. Right. Uh, I think this would be the last question from me. If you were to talk to a lay person in the street out there, because now we are talking uh, a field that you are in, but then you need to take it out there to somebody who's not in the field the structural biology, how will you explain exactly what you're explaining to me? Like now questions of monkeypox, you know, coronaviruses. You talk about all these things, mutations and so forth. If you are to talk to somebody who's not in that field, to make sure that this particular person understand and move with, because remember this is a citizen is contributing to this country as well, to make sure that we are all a team player in this country. How will you at least be your message down there to such a person? Yeah, so in, in, in explaining the principle, you know, we always find it very difficult for scientists to, as scientists, to explain things in laymen. And we don't believe that, uh, especially myself, I believe there's no laymen, um, unless if, 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 if one can say that we have a, a largely society that ignores a lot of things. If you go to America and you talk about structural biology, Chances are out of five people, one of them will know, even though they may be coming from engineering or accounting. But what I will say is that, you know, the field, the structure of biology basically is about checking all the components of your body at atomic level, understanding them at that level to ensure that those that have deficiencies are able to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, treated. Basically, it's about being able to see something uh, 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 that you cannot see with a naked eye, but go as far as seeing the inner part and the detailed part of such a, a, a molecule or a part or, 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 or a, an organ, uh, if I may, if I may say. Hmm. All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, that was Daniel Ndema, the CEO of K Bio, joining us for our Speak to a Scientist webinar. Thank you very much to you, uh, Daniel Ndema. Uh, for joining us and for enhancing our Speak to a Scientist program. And yes, I do as well uh, <clears throat> invite you to come in person to Cybone Discovery Center in Newtown in Johannesburg uh, to also bless us. And probably there will be two, three things that we can also add you know, to our science center. This science center is for people like you to come and share their insight so that we also take this insight out there to the public as we deal with public together with learners. So please do not keep this insight that you are having to yourself. You are more than welcome to also step in here to assist us with further developments that Saibone is undertaking in making sure that the public 
stay aware of all these things that are in within the environment that we are living with. Thank you very much uh, to you, uh, Daniel Ndema. Thank you very much to our senior science center manager, uh, Akash Dasrath, for joining us. Uh, thank you to the background that has been assisting us with whatever technique that we might need. Thank you to all the participants who have joined this. Thank you to the questions. It shows that uh, among the people that we are living with, uh, Mr. Daniel Ndema, we still have those colleagues that are still saying, no, we are aware. We just want to pursue to highest levels. Thank you very much to everybody who have joined this webinar. Until next time, thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.